What up, people? Push a Wild Black here with Push a Wild Black Sports. And Cleveland just beat Boston by three, 102 to 99. Uh, LeBron James, 29, 16, and nine. Almost had a triple double like he's prone to do. And I'm going to try to get these thoughts on this game real quick because TNT got that double header and they're doing the ring ceremony. So. Real quick, Gordon Hayward broke his ankle. It looked worse than it probably actually is. Um, from what I'm hearing, they already set his ankle um, in the locker room before they even transported him. They Halfway through the fourth quarter, they were uh, just then sending him to the, um, to the hospital. So it looked horrible. It looked really, really bad. But it, um, matter of fact, Kevin Har- Harlan said right when it happened that uh, he broke his leg and it looked really bad. He was going up for alley oop, if y'all didn't see it. He was going up for alley oop. He actually tried to go up in between two people and he brushed against LeBron. It, re- it, it really wasn't a, like, nobody really undercut him, but he landed wrong. And when he landed wrong, you can kind of you can hear the snap really, so there was a snap there, and you heard the the sound. He wasn't up, and Kevin Harlan said right then and there he broke his leg. So Boston was really because it was really emotional. So Boston went real slow for the rest of the first half, and part of the third quarter. But uh, they finished the third quarter on an 11, what is it, 20, was it 24 to 11 run? Yeah, it was 24 to 11 run. And I don't know if, see, I never really thought that Gordon Hayward was <coughs> the main catalyst of the offense anyway. It was going to be Kyrie Irving, and it was going to be how. Kyrie Irving is going to mesh with those young kids in Boston. Um, Gordon Hayward was nice. I didn't think they were going to beat Cleveland with Gordon Hayward and Kyrie Irving. I still don't think they're going to beat them now. Uh, Charles Barkley said that they, their season is over. Their season is not over. I do think, though, they'll end up being not necessarily second in the playoffs, but they may end up being, like, people are saying that they they might not ink the t- a top four spot. Okay, you got Toronto. You got, I had Toronto being third, and I had Washington being fourth. Okay. So, they're still going to be in the playoffs. They may be fifth. So, that knocks them down maybe a couple of spots. I still think with Kyrie Irving and I think with uh, with Brown, yeah, I think with Kyrie Irving and I think with Jalen Brown, if Jalen Brown continues to from what I saw last night and from what I little bit of from what I saw of him last year if Jalen Brown is consistent because he had 25 points today and he shot let's see thought he had more threes than that it says he only had two three pointers but he had 20 25 points. If he ends up having 25 points, if he averages like 25, 30 points consistently and he's the second option and Kyrie Irving is, um, and Kyrie Irving did a real good job of, um, let's see the assist here. I'm looking, I'm, uh, Kyrie Irving, what was the assist? Yeah, I thought he had 10 assists. Looking at the uh, stat sheet as I'm recording this. Okay. He had 10 assists. 22 and uh, 
39 minutes, 22 points, 10 assists. Okay. I didn't think Gordon Hayward was going to be a main option in that offense anyway. I figured it was going to be Kyrie Irving and someone else. I figured Gordon Hayward was going to be a, a nice addition, but I didn't know how it was going to be in the offense because they had all that young talent. You don't know how Jason Tatum was going to be. He started off real slow, but he, he finished decent. He ended up with 14 points. So I don't necessarily know how this is going to affect them as far as the season goes. Yeah, you lose a weapon, but I think they'll be fine. And Marcus Smart, he's always been a good defender. He's always been a, a good rebounder. If he's going to be, because Kyrie Irving and Marcus Smart, there were moments that they played together. So if they played together, then and Marcus Smart is basically a defender and he can put in 12 to like 17 points a game, Boston will be fine. I don't necessarily know if um, it's enough to beat Cleveland in a seven-game series. And then you don't know when Hayward is coming back, if he comes back this season. So Boston will be fine. It sucks for Hayward, though, because I really – I looked at that injury and I was like, oh, that's everybody cringed in that. So it was a good game by Boston. Now for Cleveland, from what I saw for Cleveland, LeBron James does what LeBron James does, 29-16 and 9 assists. And let's talk about everybody else. Um, Everybody talked about D-Wade coming there. And everybody talked about D-Wade and Derrick Rose going, coming there. Derrick Rose showed flashes of his own self. You can tell the explosiveness isn't there. The moves, he, the crossover still there. His ability to, like, still get around people is still there. But his explosiveness, as far as him jumping out the gym and dunking on everybody, those are layups now. So... But he did do real good when it came to the offense as far as what his role is. Now, D-Wade, Derrick Rose, and LeBron started and finished the game. LeBron still closed. D-Wade is going to have – D-Wade had eight, eight points. He played 28 minutes, but it was in spurts. I didn't even think he played that long because there were spurts where it was like he was in for five minutes – then he rested for a lot. Then he came back in again. He ended up closing. But um, Jeff Green was base. Jeff Green was a defender. He was a um, – now, he had six points, but he was a defender. He ran the floor real well. He spaced the floor well. Kevin Love did good at the center position. And J.R. Smith was still effective, like – Everybody was met, was wondering how he would take coming off the bench. It really didn't matter because he ended up getting, let's see, Derrick Rose had 31 minutes. D-Wade had 28 minutes. J.R. Smith had 21. So it was like, okay, he didn't start, but he still had a good 21-minute clip of playing time, and he still had 10 points. And he was able to hit a couple of, let's see here, he was able to hit, I think, three, three three-pointers. So, yeah, it was, um, it was a good game. I don't think that this is still going to be the finals or the semifinals, depending on how they land, the Celtics land. I think if Derrick Rose stays healthy, I think Derrick Rose can be a nice little this can be a little renaissance spot for his career as far as because he was able to break people down. He had that three at the end of the half. And, um, you know, it's it's going to be weird seeing him and it's going to be different seeing him in Cleveland now. It's going to be because I'm we're so used to seeing him like be his old jump out the gym him. It's going to be weird seeing him like not be able to do that. I do think he's going to end up being better. 
than he is than he was in New York because he's basically he's gonna play off the ball sometimes, but sometimes, especially with that second unit unit, because a lot of times he was in there with Jeff Green, Kyle Corver in the second unit. If he's basically the second unit and he's setting everybody up in the second unit, then or it's kind of like a six-man situation for him, then he'll be fine. One of the things with New York was they were running the triangle, and he averaged 13 points with the triangle, which isn't really a point guard-friendly offense. Jeff Hornacek was forced to run a variation of the triangle and the stuff that he likes to run in New York, and Derrick Rose was still able to be effective. This is a situation where Derrick Rose is going to be asked to score a lot. And him and Wade. And Wade is going to have his moments throughout the season. He had some moments today. And he's going to play a lot, but they're going to space out the time that he does play. The biggest thing for the biggest two bright spots for Cleveland, really, is um, Jeff Green and Jay Crowder. Jay Crowder was could shoot the three. He was a defender. He rebounded. And Jeff Green spaced the floor. And he was a defender. So it was a good game. So I'm going to stop this recording. And I'm going to watch the, um, the um, Cleveland. Not Cleveland. I'm going to watch the Golden State and Houston game. And then do a vlog right after this. We'll upload both of these two vlogs at the same time. All right. See y'all later. Push the wall black out. So I actually watched the um, Rockets and Warriors game right after the um, Cleveland one and watched it all the way through. So these files are going to be mixed together and will be uploaded tomorrow. So anyway... The Rockets beat the Warriors by one. Kevin Durant was literally a point second off in that shot. Otherwise, the Warriors would have won. Houston won that game basically because they were able to break down the Warrior defense and get to the lane. And if you're looking at film of this game, and it's really early, but if you're looking at film in this game and you're saying, like, then you're saying that's how the the Warriors got beat, then Cleveland has a chance in theory. But you still have to shoot through. See, here's the thing with the Warriors. You have to outscore them. I know Charles was like, you know, because at the half they were getting – and at the half, the Rockets weren't, they were talking about Chris Paul and the Rockets really weren't getting him involved. And they were saying, like, I don't know. Charles Barkley was saying, I don't know how you're going to, how everybody thinks they're going to outscore them. Well, that's how you beat them. But you, because they didn't really, they stopped them as in not necessarily spurts, but in possessions. And that's what you got to do. Like, you have to keep close to them and you have to stop them in little spurts and in little independent situations to be close. And you have to realize that with the Warriors, you'll get close. They'll go through runs. You'll go through runs. You have to have the talent to withstand the runs, which Houston does. And I think... Um, OKC does too, but... We'll we'll see when they play each other. But Houston, I always thought Houston had the three point power to come close to them. The situation was last year, can they could guard anybody? And the reason why in my preview I put them as fourth is because I didn't know if they were going to be able to guard people in the Western Conference. It looks like they were able to at least slow the Warriors down in enough to get back and enough to withstand a run and to get back. Eric Gordon breaking the Warriors defense down and not necessarily shooting threes because he went 0 for 6, 
But him breaking the Warriors down and him being able to go to the lane, um, Tucker did the same thing, but he was also able to shoot th- threes. He went four for six. And uh, let me see. Maba. Oh, my God. It pronounced, let me see if I pronounce his name correctly. I'm killing his brother's name. Uh, Lou Ba Amante. He went, let's see, 6 8 power forward. He was also able to, def- to defend and also get in the lane a little bit and kind of score. So, but he was able to defend him, PJ Tucker, to a lesser extent, Gordon. They were able to break down the Warrior D. De- Defense and they were able to s- score. They were they were able to defend, so they weren't able to defend. Like the score doesn't necessarily say, well, they really didn't defend well. They you got to defend them in in spurts. You got to slow them down in spurts and realize that they're gonna go through a run. And you got to have the talent and you have to have the three point ability to catch up to them, which Houston actually does. And with Gordon and with Harden and with all the people that they have, they're going to be able to to hang in there with, with Golden State. I don't know if you'll be able to do it in a, in a seven-game series, though, when the playoffs get here, but you'll be able to at least make it competitive. And that's really what all you can do as far as them. You have to have the three-point ability to match them in some cases, catch up to them, and you got to be able to defend. And not necessarily does D'Antoni have an offense, has a style that's conducive to defense, but he does have some defenders on the team that are willing to be on the ball defenders. So that's how they were able to catch up. But if you can't catch up to the Golden State Warriors, that's crazy how they were able to do that. Nick Young, if that's the first dude coming off your bench, the Warriors bench got a lot better just with him. But they got a lot better. They've always been underrated defense. They've always been an underrated defense team. They've um, they've always been able to block with Kevin Durant and actually the JaVel McGee, but he didn't play. But now, you they still have that underrated defense, and your bench got better. Bench got a lot better. When Nick Young is like shooting like that, and he doesn't, ha- and they want him though. They want him to have the green light to score. Yeah, they're going to the conference finals. I don't see anybody that, other than Houston and maybe OKC that's going to be able to beat them. But uh, wow. But yeah, it was it was a good game. Um, Curry played okay. Everybody played okay. Every like no one really took off like scoring wise. No one really took off like we're we're gonna drop forty or we're gonna drop thirty. Clay Thompson was hot early. Nick Young was hot early. KD was consistent. Curry, it was Curry, but he didn't. He had moments in the game where he wasn't he was he got into foul trouble early so he really wasn't there consistently but everybody had a really balanced game on the Warriors and that's what you got to worry about like do you have the horses to catch up to them and Houston did in several spots because they were down by 17 they were able to catch up by to catch up then it was another run and they were able to catch up again and so on and so on until the last couple of minutes they were close enough to where they were able to ink out the win. So, yeah, it was a good game. I don't think Chris Paul is going to work at all because either Chris Paul is going to have to run that offense and Chris Paul has to, like, learn in that offense to move. You can't call for the ball back on a rebound. You can't slow the ball. 
you can slow the ball down in certain situations, but that team likes to run and that team likes to that team likes to run to a certain extent and that team likes to move the ball around. Then Tony's offense is not we walk the ball down the down the court. So he gotta push the ball, man. Or I don't think he's gonna make it past the season, like through the whole season. I think he's a candidate for a mid trade de- for mid season trade or trade deadline trade because him slowing the ball down and Harden does that too. Harden did that a couple of times too, but they fear Harden because um, Chris Webber said it best. You can with Harden, he can he can dribble be he can over dribble because if, when he over dribbles. You have to respect the three, and you have to respect the fact that he can dunk on you in, um, if he breaks you off the dribble. So with Chris Paul, I don't know if you're going to respect him. You may respect him to shoot the three, but I don't know if you're going to respect him to go to the lane and um, and dunk on you. you can, and I'm not saying Chris Paul isn't a break-you-down point guard because I've seen him do that. But he does that in, like, half-court sets. And Cardin does the same thing. So one of those two guys has to take a step back as far as handling the ball. And as far as I know, D'Antoni is not going to, from what it seemed like today, and Chris Paul had a knee issue today, I don't know if Chris Paul is going to be the dude that takes over the majority of the ball handling skills. Consistently, so we'll see how that goes. But I sincerely think he's gonna end up getting traded at the by the trading deadline. So one quick thing before I close, and I just didn't want to do this until Thursday until the Bulls actually play. But the hell is Bobby Portis doing, man? Like apparently, him and Nico Mirchik got into an altercation. In practice today, and they got into a shoving match, and Bobby Portis sucker punched him in the jaw, broke his jaw. So Nico's out for the foreseeable future because he has to get his jaw shut. You got to get your jaw shut. You have to drink. You have to drink your meals. So you're basically gonna lose a lot of weight, and you might not be in playing weight. So, and Bobby Portis is, quote, based on a Bleacher Report article, is going to be out for a few weeks. So, he's going to be suspended. I don't know if he's going to be suspended. I don't know if he's going to be sent down to the uh, Windy, Windy City Bulls. I don't know if they're going to cut him. Apparently, this has been um, a few years in the making. If you follow some of the, tw- the Twitter comments at the end of the Bleacher Report article, and I will post the Bleacher Report article in the description, but yeah, they've been going at it since Bobby Portis got there. So, or no, nah, what, what was it? What was the Twitter thing? Apparently, this is three years in the making. Nico has broken bones in his face, and uh, Portis agitated them. So, nah, but um, yeah. The thing that ticks me off about this whole situation is your best power forward. The Bulls are gonna be bad this year, and this will. I'm probably gonna say some some to the effect Thursday when I actually do a video on the Bulls when they play the the Raptors, but the Bulls are gonna be bad this season. They're gonna be really bad this season. Most people think they're gonna win. 20 games. I think they're going to win anywhere between 25 to 27 games. That's still bad. But from what I've seen in the preseason, from what Fred wants to do, it's more, it's really like the offense that the Golden State Warriors are trying to to run. And he has, the only veteran that he really has is Lopez. He has a bunch of young kids and or he has a bunch of like second tier guys that are in their prime now, and 
they're still young. So, Levine is out. I don't know what Chris Dunn is going to do. Is going to be as far as a guard. But in regards to this situation, your best power forward was Paul Zipser as far as what he's able to do, as far as what the offense says he can do, as far as what the offense requires you to do, and the fact that he can shoot the three. The the Bulls are going to be a three-point shooting Golden State Warriors East type of squad, and your best lineup as far as, like, the front court is Lopez, not because he's a three-point shooter, because he isn't, but Hoiberg already said he's going to be a three-point shooter. Hoiberg already said he's going to start. So that's – you're basically going to be Lopez in your, as your center. Then you're then it's basically random. It's like whoever earns it. And this is what Hoiberg said during training camp. There is not going to be a starting lineup. In, unless somebody earns it. He doesn't know what his rotation is or anything like that. From what I've seen, it's going to go. It's From what I've seen, Nico is still inconsistent. And I like Nico Miritich, but he's inconsistent. Your best consistent forward is, as far as threes go, and as far as like basketball IQ, is Paul Zipser. And then the rookie, uh can't think of the dude's name, but the guy that they drafted. Marketing. Lori Marketing. So, and he's young. I don't know if he's going to start. From what I've seen, his range is crazy. He can, he's tall. He can rebound. He has shooting ability like Dirk Nowitzki, really. And he should be starting. As far as if you, what you want to do, he should be starting. So, that's your small forward, power forward, because you can he can play power forward. And Paul Zipser is your small forward. Nico is coming off the bench. As far as your guards go, they just got K Felder. He can shoot the three and he can break down defenses a little bit, but he's five seven. I know he's listed as five nine, but he's five seven. Okay. And just a holiday. And Chris Chris Dunn, if he's healthy, because Chris Dunn can defend. His shooting ability is like, eh, but if you have a strong front court that can at least, with at least two players that can shoot and maybe three players that can shoot, Bobby Portis is off the bench and Nico's off the bench because Nico's inconsistent. Nico's streaky. So you're fighting for a base, you're, you're fighting for bench time. You're not fighting for a starting position. Because if I'm Fred Hoiberg, I wouldn't start both of y'all anyway. Both of y'all are coming off the bench. Nico is my sixth man. Portis is my... Portis is in the rotation. Nico is my sixth man just because he's inconsistent. Until he's consistent, I wouldn't have started him anyway. So now Nico's out and Bobby Portis is out. So for a couple of weeks, if he's not cut or released... So, anyway, because of the stupidness of the Bulls, this went longer than I wanted it to. But I will holler at y'all later. Pushing Wild Black out. Peace.